Hello, and welcome to another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore. The Poison Pen's distinguished guest author today is Valerie Burns, whose new book is Two Part Sugar, One Part Murder, um, a delightful cozy, the start to a new series. Before we begin our chat today, I'd like to let those listening in know that the Poison Pen does have copies of Two Part Sugar, One Part Murder, and we would be delighted to hold one for you or put one in the mail. It's real easy. Just give us a call at the bookstore or go online and you can be connected with this truly terrific book. And now I'd like to welcome Valerie. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. We're delighted you could join us. Um, I'm always fascinated by who an author was before they became published. Can you tell us a little bit about Valerie, pre-publication? Okay. Um, well, I am from a small town in Northwest Indiana. Um, so you might recognize it as the place where uh, Maddie Montgomery lands when she starts, <laughs> uh, when her airplane uh, lands. So um, actually I'm from South Bend, Indiana, and I've lived um, a lot in the Midwest, in Southwest Michigan and Northwest Indiana. So for those who aren't familiar with the area, um, the University of Notre Dame, which is one of my alma maters is there. And I worked, man, I worked as a planner. Um, I worked um, as a uh, trainer a corporate trainer for um, a number of companies and now I'm a operations manager for a um, appliance manufacturer. Yeah. I left the cold and <laughs> went to, um, I now live in uh, northern Georgia, East Tennessee area. So those are a lot of the things that I did before um, I started writing. What prompted you to decide I want to become an author and what was your path to publication initially like? Well, I think that I don't know that I grew up wanting to be an author. I grew up loving books and loving mysteries and reading a lot of mysteries. And over the years, over the decades, I had a list of man, I wish somebody would write a book about, I wish there was a mystery about, and that list just kept growing and growing and growing. And I'm not finding that book out in the world. And at some point, you know, you read so many mysteries and you think, well, maybe I, maybe I should try my hand at writing that. If I want to read it, maybe there's somebody else out there like me who might want to read that too. So I think that's what kind of sparked my desire to want to write. Um, but honestly, if somebody had written those books, I probably would be content just to sit at home and read books all the time and not necessarily have to go through all the work of, you know, writing. Because hmm. it's a lot of work. It is. People don't realize that. Um, if I understand correctly, you initially, the book that became your first published book was Traveling Shoes. Shoes. So Traveling Shoes is the first book I ever wrote, and it was actually not the first book that got published. Oh. The Plot is Murder, which is the first book in my Mystery Bookshop series, is the first book that got published, but Traveling Shoes was the first book that I wrote. And if anybody's ever read that one, they are going to recognize a lot of things that are familiar to my hometown of South Bend, Indiana, and um, just the university that's there, and that community. So that was the first book that I wrote. Okay. Um, now, if I also understand correctly, you kind of got some professional training in writing. You went to Seton Hill University? Is that I did. So um, that was actually when I, when I decided I want to be a writer, um, I you know, I don't feel like you need a degree to be a writer, you know, anybody can, you know, can write, um, but it may not be something that people want to read. It may not be written well, it may not be formatted properly, you know, you, you may have an idea, but you might need to polish, perfect, and, and get your story, you know, better 
um, so that people will want to read it. So it will be publishable. And so I wrote traveling shoes and sent out a ton of query letters to agents and editors and never could get any interest in it, you know, and I, you know, would get something back and maybe rewrite it and then, you know, revise, rewrite, try again. And I, I joke that I probably have enough rejections to wallpaper a room. So, you know, but the thing is, I, I didn't give up. And I decided I'm going to look at the some authors that I really like and respect and see what they did to get, you know, where they are. And one of those authors was Victoria Thompson. Um, she writes the Gaslight Mystery Series, and I really loved her books. And I remember pulling her book off the shelf and reading her bio in the back. And I had read the bio in the back of her book many times, but this time was different. So this, I looked at it and she changed her bio and she'd updated it to say that she was an adjunct professor at Seton Hill University in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. And I had never heard of Seton Hill. I didn't know where Greensburg, Pennsylvania was. And, but at the time I was living in Indiana. And so not that far away, a few hours, I looked it up and I realized that they had a master's and a master's in fine arts in writing popular fiction. And she was one of the adjunct professors. And I remember thinking, if I could just maybe audit one of her classes, I already had a master's degree from Notre Dame. I'm like, I don't want another master's degree. I just want to know how to write. And so I, they did not have a option for auditing, but I went ahead and I applied and it wasn't until I actually started filling out the application and going through the process that the desire to, you know, get another degree actually came to me, but I um, got accepted into their program. And um, it was the great thing about that program is that it's a low residency program. So I didn't have to quit my job and, you know, be on campus for, you know, two and a half years. You basically, you take classes virtually and then twice a year for one week each time you go on campus for residency. Mm -hmm. And so I did that and my first residency, Victoria Thompson was not only an adjunct professor in the program, but she also was a student in the program working on her MFA. And so the interesting thing to me was I got to listen to her thesis defense, which, you know, while I was there. And so it was really a great experience for me. I learned so much. I feel like I would not be published today were it not for the things that I learned in that program, um, which taught me how to write well it taught me how to tell a story and the you know getting the critique and the feedback that you get from your peers and the other professors all the professors in the program are published authors mm -hmm. from a variety of genres so I learned a lot about I can be very focused and I love mystery so my to be read pile of mysteries is huge mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily take time away from those to read horror or romance, that program forced me to, and I learned so much from reading outside of my genre because there were so many interesting things going on in the science fiction world and in romance and in horror. It's interesting because Seton Hill is one of the few academic universities that offers a degree in popular fiction. All yes. the other universities focus on literary fiction or something like that. Exactly. And that was very, um, it was, I think, one of the things that I really loved about the program. And I've heard from other students who maybe tried other writing programs, other MFAs, and they focus on literary fiction and not necessarily on popular fiction or genre fiction. And um, it's it's like night and day and they're very encouraging and if you're in at Seton Hill and you want to write literary fiction 
you know, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But you get to, you know, do what you're passionate about. And that's one of the things that was really exciting for me about the program. So you went through the program and that helped you get your first book published. Is that correct? Yes, I got, you know, the, you have two mentors when you're a student in the program. And my first mentor was an ex New York city police officer. So he was able to help me with some of the details. No, a cop's not going to act like that. You know, you're going to need to change this. And then my second mentor was a um, woman who wrote cozy mysteries. So I felt like I got the best of both worlds in that. And they really helped me to know what I needed to do to make my story better and make it more interesting. I finished my, my thesis early in the two and a half years. I finished a little early and I had another idea. And I'm like, what if I wrote a mystery about a woman who's writing a mystery? <laughs> and so that was the theory behind um, my mystery bookshop series. And so that was a, um, I started that project around my last semester at Seton Hill. And I, while I'm sending out queries for traveling shoes, I was finishing The Plot is Murder. And when I finished and went through a few passes of edits, I decided I'm gonna just try sending out a query for this and and that's what people were interested in. So that book sold first and I got a three book deal. And then, um, you know, publishing's a little slow. <laughs> so yeah. before the, you know, the, the first book even came out, I still was sending queries for traveling shoes and I, found a publisher that was interested in publishing traveling shoes so was that camel press right? yes mm -hmm. that's a really unique press out on the west coast yes there aren't a lot out on the west coast and it's a small press but they have um some really good books that have you know won some awards out there so now we come to your new book which is the launch of a new series what can you tell us about two parts sugar one part murder so two part sugar, one part murder is a story about a fashionista, social media maven, uh, Maddie Montgomery, who's a Navy brat. Her dad was a Navy admiral and he's pretty much spoiled her. So she's never really had to fend for herself and she's lived this kind of fairy tale life, I guess. And in when her fiance decides to dump her in the middle of their live stream wedding, she's humiliated and she just wants to find some place to hide. So she learns that her great aunt Octavia, who she never really knew, um, has died and left her a house, a bakery, and a 250 pound English Mastiff in the small town of New Bison, Michigan. Well, Maddie's never heard of New Bison, so perfect place to hide out. Uh -huh. So she goes to New Bison and she decides, I'm going to sell this house and everything and come back triumphant, except she learns that Aunt Octavia had other plans. And she stipulated that in order for Maddie to inherit, she has to live in New Bison and run the bakery and keep the dog for one year. Mm -hmm. After a year, if she wants to sell, she can. But Great Aunt Octavia did not want her to just sell to these wealthy developers from the big city who want to come in and buy up all the land. Well, Maddie can't cook, but she's mm -hmm. willing to give it a try. So she does, and she, not long after she arrives, um, the mayor who runs a hardware store next door is murdered, and Maddie's fingerprints are all over the murder weapon. So she's got to figure out who done it. And so that's really the start of, you know, Maddie's story is kind of coming into her own and learning to be independent and to, 
use her her skills mm -hmm. to you know solve crime there's so many wonderful things about the book one of them is that there's also a connection to sherlock um <laughs> in the new it's the baker street series you, i mean it took me a while because I'm not always the sharpest blade in the door, but I did pick up on that. I thought, wow, it's not only a baking culinary mystery, but you've got the Sherlock connection. And does that come from your own love of classic? Oh, yeah. I love mysteries. I love Sherlock Holmes. I love Agatha Christie. I'm a huge Agatha Christie fan. And um, I thought it would be interesting to have these Baker Street Irregulars who are her team of, mm -hmm. of friends who will help her to solve the mystery and not so much like her Sherlock in that he used children, mm -hmm. but, you know, maybe upgrade those a little bit and make them a little bit older and utilize their street smarts and savvy to uh, help her solve crime. I love throwing in little um, things in my books and sometimes people get them and sometimes they don't, but it just makes writing fun for me to throw things in there like new bison is based on the city of new buffalo in michigan oh, and you okay. know if you're not from that area you may not know that there's no new new bison but people are like hey is that based on new buffalo it's like yes it is <laughs> <laughs> one of the other wonderful things about the book is the way that you kind of give readers multi-generational characters sometimes in a series you get a focus on a group of like 20 something or 30 something characters but you've also incorporated older characters as well as a few younger ones and they're portrayed in a very realistic way a very natural way very relatable way can you talk a little bit about how you incorporated especially older characters into the well, series thank you thank you i appreciate that so my my first job when I graduated from college was working as a planner for an area agency on aging. And I was about 22 years old and I'm working at an organization that supports senior citizens. My secretary was 85. I had a data clerk who was um, in her 60s. And so I'm the youngest person in this office. And I learned so much from these seniors. One of my jobs was um, as a planner, I would go to the organizations that the area agency funded. And the area agency on aging, most people don't know a whole lot about it, but they've been around since the 1960s. It was signed by, you know, Lyndon Johnson and so through the Older Americans Act. So there is an area agency on aging that covers every county in the United States and they provide services. So most people have heard of Meals on Wheels. Those are one of the services that the area agency funds. One of my jobs was to go around and make sure that the agencies we funded were adhering to all the regulations from the federal, state, and local level. Well, I that required me going to senior centers and eating. So I would sit down and I would eat with a lot of seniors and they would tell me stories. And I learned so much from them. The office manager at the area agency was, and you know, she was probably in her 60s. And she took me to the casino. She taught me to play the numbers. <laughs> and she, so I learned a lot from being around seniors who were active and vital. My secretary, Rebecca, who was 85, she, would, um, she was doing this no aging diet. And she used to walk to work every day. And she was just very active. And I, I wanted to incorporate that. So in my mystery bookshop series, you see the girls from the senior, um, the nursing, um, it's not a nursing home, it's a retirement village that helps Samantha solve mysteries. And in this story, I have, you know, Hannah, who is one of the bakers. And, you know, I want to incorporate people from a variety of age groups and diversity into my books. So diversity, not just with, 
you know, the race of, you know, people, but also with the age and um, their lifestyles. Okay. So hopefully I can do that justice and be fair and not just show one side. I don't want to just show seniors as old and, and maybe um, disabled they're active and vital and they can, you know, do a lot. And young people, even though younger people may be more into social media than older people, um, they also can, you know, make mistakes and they can learn things. And there's a lot that they can add to, you know, I, I, run into this a lot in my day job is, you know, it's like, oh, well, there's, they spend all their time on their phones, but whenever we have a problem where they're the ones we go to, it's like, hey, can you fix this for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you um, kind of incorporated that into Maddie, who's got it, her social media savvy skills that help kind of, I guess, rejuvenate the bakery. That's the plan is that she's going to use those skills to help, um, bring more people to the bakery and then also to her friend Tyler who's running a, a yarn knitting shop and so using the skills that she has but then also using the skills that she doesn't necessarily have with baking so recognizing through her social media savvy that people are interested in those outtakes they're interested in things that don't go perfect mm -hmm. and so people will come to the bakery to see you know this person who can't bake and mm -hmm. to maybe taste some of the things that she manages to actually complete I think you were very um smart in doing that I guess there's a new I guess it's an app I'm not sure I don't know the technology but it's called be real where people are kind of reacting to the perfection of Instagram and they want those real moments. Yeah. yeah, I think that one thing I noticed during the pandemic, um, I used to watch a lot of baking shows and, you know, they're, they're perfect. You know, everything comes out perfect. It all happens in 30 minutes or 60 minutes. And there's, you know, the shots that you got from those shows were amazing. Well, during the pandemic, the shows continued, but they had to come up with another, you know, you didn't have a photographer living in your home. Okay. And so you had family members and friends who are taking the pictures. And there are a lot of outtakes of the things that didn't go well. And so people kind of gravitate towards that. They love seeing that, you know, okay, I know this famous baker is, you know, wealthy and doing well, but she drops eggs on the floor just like me. Mm -hmm. um, you've mentioned the bakery and the food. Um, did you develop the recipes in two parts sugar, one part murder? A lot of the recipes in two parts sugar, one part murder are adaptations from um, other recipes that I've tried and then oh well I think it could use a little more of this and you know so you kind of have a base that you start from but then you tweak it and perfect it and make it your own um, there are some things that I just don't like and I skip those ingredients and you know it's like yeah you might like that recipe but now nah, I'm not so much into cinnamon so I'm gonna downplay the cinnamon and I'm gonna add more of this and so um, they're mostly things that I've adapted. Hmm. Um, two part sugar, one part murder is marketed and it's positioned as a cozy mystery. How would you define a cozy mystery? What do you think are the necessary ingredients? So for cozy mysteries, you almost always have an amateur sleuth and you they typically take place in small towns or in some type of smaller contained setting. Um, there are more cozies that are, you know, kind of expanding out. So you see them in LA and you see them in New York City, but generally you're going to contain the area to maybe the, I don't know, 
college that the protagonist works at or the bakery and the people who come into the bakery. But usually it's kind of a smaller um, town setting. And uh, with a cozy, there is not going to be a lot of blood, guts, and gore. So you are not going to get the graphic details of that dead body. Um, you tend to um, find a, the protagonist just sort of stumbles across the dead body. And I always equate, you know, when I talk to people about cozies, I always say, have you ever seen Murder, She Wrote? Because that's kind of the quintessential cozy mystery. You've got an amateur solving a case. Jessica Fletcher stumbles across a dead body. And there's not going to be any bad language. So that, and there will be no um, explicit sex. So no sex, no bad language, and no, um, no description of the, the body or the, the gore associated with that. So I, look, I love the fact that cozy mysteries to me are like a puzzle. So if, if people like puzzles, I think they would like cozy mysteries because it's not so much about this dead body on the floor it's about finding the clues to figure out who done it so you're reading a story and you're hopefully so lost into the details of the story in this fictional world that the authors created that you're not necessarily paying attention to the fact that she said there's mud on the bottom of that person's shoe. So that's one of the clues that the author may give you that would help you to figure it out. But hopefully it's not so obvious that you don't get that puzzle feel. You don't um, feel challenged a little bit. I think that's um, really insightful. In many ways, Cozy's kind of parallel golden age or classic mysteries because you do have the focus on the whodunit and you do have that closed circle of suspects whether it's a neighborhood or a small town. Um, I had read somewhere and I'm paraphrasing what you had written that one of the challenges in writing cozy mysteries is incorporating all the things readers love about it those elements but also making it seem realistic. I mean you can't it's still murder so you can't treat right. it as just like a, a game how do you walk that line you know it it can be a challenge to um make sure that you are presenting something I think part of it is just for me I like my mysteries to be practical mm -hmm. I love cozy mysteries I've already suspended my disbelief that this faker this you know knitter bookshop owner librarian is going out and they're solving crimes but there's only so far that i can go i can't go to oh they're going to break into someone's home and they're going to start ransacking it or they're going to interrogate someone because part of me is like why would anybody answer their questions so it's you you need to make sure that your sleuth is sleuthing <laughs> they're detecting they're finding out um, the clues without going too far. So I guess that's, that's it, is just trying to figure out where that line is and what is just too much for me to believe as a reader. And I think a lot of that comes from, I love mystery. So I, I'm a reader. I have to figure out, well, how far can my imagination go? Can my imagination extend to someone actually you know confronting a killer or you know do I need to back up a little bit and figure out another way to get to my big reveal at the end without make putting my heroine in danger and making her do something that I wouldn't do that's that's very um thoughtful. Um, let's talk a little about the writing process itself, because especially with mysteries, at least I'm not a writer, so I'm just imagining, but you have to know where the clues are going to go. There's a structure to it. You can't just kind of throw it all together and hope it sticks, so to speak. Um, what is your own writing? Though there are some authors that do that and they can pull it off. Uh, what is your own writing process? When you start a mystery, how does it work for you? 
So usually when I start a mystery, I start, I, I always start with the characters. I am very character focused. I spend a lot of time getting to know my characters, getting to know how they're going to respond in different situations. Who is Maddie Montgomery? What is she like? What is she not like? How would she, you know, how is she going to respond if she's, you know, encounters a 250 pound English master for the first time? And so once I feel confident with who my characters are, I generally will start um, with, I, I almost always know who's gonna die. I, I don't know that I've ever started a mystery and I didn't know who the victim was. Mm -hmm. What is often challenging for me is who the killer is. Uh -huh. I will start with an idea of who the killer is, but often that can change by the time I get to the end of the book. So I kind of have an idea in my mind of, the characters of the setting of the situation that I want to put them in. I, I do a lot of, wow, I wonder what would happen if, I wonder what it would be like if, if I had someone who was from a big city who never really lived in the Midwest, who was a little bit spoiled and didn't know how to bake, didn't know how to cook, didn't know how to turn on a gas stove. If I put them in a situation where these they're in this situation okay now how are they going to behave and how are they going to and then there's there's a murder and they're going to need to figure out who done it now i call myself a pantser i don't generally have a detailed play by play of what's going to happen in every scene every beat of my story I love to write and let the characters just sort of go where they will and see where the story takes me. I often will find myself in a situation where I'm like, wow, I didn't see that coming. I wonder how we're going to get out of this one. And sometimes I have to set it aside for a minute. I feel like that organic nature is just, it's so exciting and invigorating for me because I hope that I'm as excited about it as readers will be when they look at this scene because I may not know what, you know how to get out of it any more than they do. Um, but generally the characters will show me how to get out of it. But I think that's the thing that makes these stories so exciting for me. And I hope it comes through in the books as I'm writing them. My editor, on the other hand, would prefer a more detailed outline of everything that's going to happen in the book. And over the years, we've kind of come to, I think, a, a very good cozy relationship where I will give him the, the synopsis of what I think is going to happen. I, he, there's no way he doesn't know that I gloss over the details. So I might spend a page and a half describing a sunset. And because I'm like, and then Maddie finds, you know, and then Maddie investigates. And then, you know, this thing happens that I know is going to happen in this book. And I might spend a page or two describing it. And then I'll rush through some other details. And then I get to the end of the book and, and I tell them who I think the who I think did it and along the way I'm like hey um yeah he didn't do it it was somebody <laughs> else so I try to keep him informed when I make a change and um yeah that's pretty much my process I I think the key is knowing my characters You've been writing for quite a while now. Um, if you could have the opportunity to go back in time to when you were first starting out, what would you tell yourself as a writer? What advice would you give yourself? Oh my, I think, I think the best advice I ever received and I wish I'd gotten it sooner is not to give up, to mm -hmm. believe in myself and to keep writing you can't edit a blank page. And if you wait for 
all of the planets to be perfectly aligned before you start, you're going to be waiting an, an awfully long time. So, you know, I, I wish I had started sooner. I wish I had um, believed in myself and not um, doubted so much because I'd probably have a lot more books finished than I do right now if I had just had the confidence to keep writing. And, you know, I think the one thing, especially for new writers, is when you get rejections, it's easy to kind of take it personally and to think you're not a good writer because you were rejected because people don't want to read this book. And one thing I've learned now is that rejection doesn't mean that your book is bad. It doesn't mean no. that your story is bad. It's timing. It's, you know, whether this is the right place for, for the book. Um, and it's also just listening because I've gotten some great advice from people who, you know, caught the vision with me, you know. So with Camel, my editor at Camel for Traveling Shoes, I got a lot of rejections for that. And, you know, I had people who told me, oh, you should change and so make the main character a private investigator instead of a police officer. And I actually rewrote it where that's what happened. And then the editor at Camel was like, you know, this just doesn't feel right. I feel like, and as we talked, I'm like, oh, he's supposed to be a police officer. She's like, yeah, I think that's what you need. And I'm like, you know, I got a version of that book. <laughs> so that's what, you know, just believing in the story that was in my heart, as opposed to necessarily listening to others and what they thought that book should be. So I don't know, that's a whole lot of stuff I would tell my younger self, but it's keep writing, believe in yourself and don't give up. Now, if I understand correctly, in addition to giving yourself advice, you're also working as a mentor at Seton Hill. I am. So that was just the most wonderful thing when I was asked to join the program and to be a mentor. And so I, I feel like Seton Hill gave me so much because I know that I don't feel that I would be published today had I not gone. And so I am excited about the opportunity to give back and to try and help others and to mentor other uh, you know writers who want to you know get their books published as well so I'm excited about it it's and it's very invigorating because writing can be very lonely you sit home alone with your laptop and you write and when I am working with my mentors, I'm reading their stuff and I'm seeing their passion and it can incite me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I feel like writing today because, you know, I've been around other people who are enthusiastic about whatever it is they're writing and it really helps. That's great. Um, one of the things that I loved about your new mystery was the fact that you incorporate your own love of classic mysteries into the story. And you talked a little bit about that. You're a big reader. In addition to golden age classic mystery writers, who are some of your other favorites, if you'd like to share any? Oh my gosh, I love mysteries. I have so many. I love British historic cozy. So I'm a huge fan okay. of Agatha Christie. I love Victoria Thompson, Emily Brightwell, okay. Rex Stout. Um, I love the Nero Wolf series. They're just amazing. I love Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I love, I have a whole lot of loves. Jill Churchill and George. Um, yeah. Just amazing um, writers. I also love um, Alexa Gordon has the Gethsemane Brown mysteries that I thought were fun. They're set in Ireland and, you know, I, see a lot of British 
mystery set in the UK, in England, not necessarily a lot in Ireland, but there, there are quite a few. Mm-hmm. So let me think. Oh, wow. My bookshelves are full of, of mysteries and cozies. And um, I have a lot of, I like uh, Deborah Goldstein. I think um, she might have triggered my um, desire to want to write a culinary cozy about someone who can't cook. So mm-hmm. she's got her Sarah Blair mysteries. And oh man, just tons of great mysteries. What's next for you as an author? Can you share anything with us? Yeah, um, actually, I am going to be starting a new series with um, Berkeley, and it's a pet detective uh, mystery. Um, The protagonist is a children's book author and she has a bloodhound bailey and bailey is the i guess instigator that gets her into trouble and figuring out crime so um that's gonna be the next series that i have um that i'm working on i also still have my mystery bookshop series and the eighth book in that series comes out uh, later this year in December. Yeah. And um, and then there will be at least two more Baker Street Mysteries. So oh. I have book uh, the second book I've turned in, um, Murder is a Piece of Cake. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'll have those three series that I'm working on. That's great. How can um, readers learn more about you? Are you on particular social media platforms? Do you have a website? I'm on pretty much all of the social media platforms, but the best way to um, find out what's going on with me and what books are coming up is through my website, vmburns.com. And I have a newsletter. You can sign up for my newsletter at my website and you will get all kinds of information about new releases and also giveaways. I usually give away books or gift cards to buy books about (laughs) once a month. And I'm also pretty active on Facebook and um, under VM Burns. So if you look for VM Burns or VM Burns books on pretty much any social media platform, that's, that's gonna, you're gonna find me. Well, that's great. I can't believe how quickly our time has gone by. You've just been an absolute delight um, to interview. Um, Our author today is Valerie Burns, whose new book is Two Parts Sugar, One Part Murder. And from what we've heard, there's more in the works, which is great news. I'd like to thank Valerie for taking time to join us today and thank those of you listening in. Thank you. I had a great time. Oh, good. Until the next time at the Poison Pen. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.